Just as every leap precedes a fall, a period of reflection precedes every ending. But not every ending provokes the same level of introspection. The end of elementary school does not provoke the same degree of existential anxiety that the end of one's life does, for instance. But the questions we ask ourselves are virtually the same. Am I ready for things to end? Did I make good use of the time preceding this moment? What will happen moving forward? It might seem odd, but these are the types of questions I am asking myself regarding this video, and they are manifesting the same anxious weight, making my stomach ache and my lungs struggle to breathe. This is because this might be the last time I ever talk about Metal Gear Solid on my channel. Unless I find something original to say about the other mainline Metal Gear games, or Konami miraculously releases a new game, this will be it. This is making me anxious because Metal Gear Solid, to me, is like what Star Wars or Lord of the Rings is to a lot of people. So much of my life, my ethics, my creativity has been built upon this series. And to think that there may never be a reason to discuss the series on my channel again, well, it legitimately makes me depressed. I've had the hardest time writing the introduction for this video, not only for that reason, but also because I want the final video to be a great one. I want every word to convey my deep admiration for the profound brilliance of this series, which will be a challenge considering Metal Gear Solid V's controversial status in the canon. A lot of people do not like this game, mainly because they perceive it as unfinished. This is mostly due to the public fallout between series creator Hideo Kojima and Konami, and how that led to cut content like the fabled Episode 51. Even if you see Metal Gear Solid V as a finished game, the story is viewed by many, including yours truly, to be the weakest in the series. That said, a poor Metal Gear Solid story is still better than most, and Metal Gear Solid V's story, as it is, remains exceptional in many, if not all, respects. The most important respect, I think, is how it powerfully and poignantly presents its core themes, just as the five previous mainline games did. In order to introduce my case most effectively, I will take a brief step back from Metal Gear Solid V and survey the retrospective videos I've done up until this point. As I just alluded to, I only like to do videos on something when I can provide an original perspective. Given that Metal Gear Solid is arguably the most analyzed game series of all time, I had a hard time figuring out how to discuss my favorite series on my channel. But I thankfully found my quote-unquote in with a tweet that Kojima made. He said that every Metal Gear Solid game has a one-word theme. For Metal Gear Solid 1, the one-word theme is Gene. For 2, Meme. 3, Scene. 4, Sense. And for Peace Walker, Peace. I decided to analyze each game in the series based on how well it exemplifies that one word theme. When I was contemplating whether or not Metal Gear Solid V did a competent job exemplifying its one word theme, I came to my conclusion in a bit of a peculiar way. I first asked myself, what would be the one word theme for the Metal Gear Solid saga? It took me a while to decide what with the suffocating number of subjects and concepts that are brought up in the series. After re-watching each of my retrospectives and thinking for several hours, the one word theme I settled upon was Will. With every game, the main character struggles to break free from those that wish to control them, with every method of control growing in intensity and deadliness. Nonetheless, in every game, we witnessed the triumph of the human will over impossible odds. And though it is only fiction, it is that theme which permanently stamped Metal Gear's influence on my heart. Then I asked myself if the theme of Will was represented well in Metal Gear Solid V. I thought, well, maybe, but not as well as the other games. But then I realized, in one respect, Metal Gear Solid V was superior than every game that came before. While it did depict the infinite strength of the human will, it did an even better job depicting the infinite weakness of it. Most often, be it in the game or in real life, the product of a weak will is a zealous race towards revenge against a person, an organization, or existence itself. Race and revenge are the one-word themes of Metal Gear Solid V. 
They are also the names of the game's two primary chapters, which is strange because they seem to be arbitrarily assigned rather than used to describe the overarching theme of their respective chapters. Revenge is more like the overarching theme for the entire game, where race shows up in brief moments throughout. Regardless, when the themes arise, they have the appropriate amount of potency required for a Metal Gear Solid game. But I will repeat what I said before. Unlike the characters from the previous games who achieve freedom from these methods of control, most of the characters of Metal Gear Solid V fail to do so, and they seek revenge in various forms as a consequence. Before we witness these numerous descents into hell, I must fulfill a promise that I made at the end of my Peace Walker video. I saved the ending of Posse's story for this video because I felt it had more relevance to MGS5's narrative, specifically her association with Big Boss's rival organization, Cypher. To explain both of these, I must once again return to the ending of Metal Gear Solid 3. At the end of that game, Big Boss, who at the time was known as Naked Snake, fulfilled the core objective of a top-secret op known as Operation Snake Eater. His objective was to kill his former mentor, the boss, the greatest soldier the world had ever known at the time. This was done in order to appease the Russian government. The Russians suffered a nuclear detonation on their soil. Given that it was the Cold War, and the fact that the Russians knew about Snake's presence in Russia at the time of the detonation, they suspected the Americans. The reality is that this nuclear detonation was a false flag operation carried out by a Russian colonel known as Volgin. In the Russians' view, killing the boss would reinstate a sense of equilibrium between the two nations. Snake saw his mission to the end, despite the unimaginable emotional pain this assassination would take on his soul. The worst part of all was that the boss was made out to be a Soviet defector, and when she died, this would be her official legacy. She would be forever seen as a disgraceful traitor. This was an apocalyptically unjust way to treat a legend, a woman who saved the world from nuclear annihilation. The disgust that Snake felt with the Americans and the Russians made him and his allies contemplate what would be the best way to enact the boss's will beyond the grave. Doing this would be a symbolic form of revenge against the powers that be. There were two primary visions. One offered by Big Boss, and another offered by the man who commanded him during Operation Snake Eater, a man codenamed Major Zero. Zero's view of the boss's will was to unite the world via control of information, as well as control of minds via nanomachines. Big Boss's view of the boss's will was the creation of an independent nation of soldiers, ones that were not bound by obligation to their governments. Their services would be contracted by the highest bidder with no bias regarding ideology or nationhood. This independent nation took on multiple forms throughout the series, but the idea behind this nation went by the same name throughout. That name was Outer Heaven. These differing views of the boss's will caused great tension between the two men. This deeply saddened Zero, because he not only felt like he would eventually lose his friend over this ideological battle, but lose a potential icon that would replace the boss, one that the world could unify around. If Big Boss would not be that icon, then Zero would need a replacement. This replacement came via the Les Enfants Terribles project. Zero sought to create clones of the boss so that one of them might become that unifying figure. Two clones were created, one named David and the other Eli. Their code names were Solid Snake and Liquid Snake. When Big Boss eventually found out about the cloning project, he cut off all ties from Zero out of pure disgust. What followed was a decades-long war between the two men. At the end of Peace Walker, we witnessed a piece of this ongoing war when Paz revealed herself to be an agent of Zero's organization, the aforementioned Cypher. She threatened to steal Big Boss's Metal Gear model, Zeke, and use it to launch a nuclear attack on the United States. Aside from the obvious lives lost and the inevitable fallout, the primary purpose of such an attack would be to permanently tarnish the reputation of Big Boss's organization, the Militaires Sans Frontières, aka MSF. By proxy, Cypher would gain the upper hand over Big Boss. After a long battle, 
Big Boss defeats Paws, with the explosions from a destroyed Metal Gear sending her flying out into the sea. Her body was never recovered. One year after the events of Peace Walker, the events of Ground Zeroes take place. Big Boss's MSF has grown to an unimaginable size, so much so that it seems to have attracted the attention of the International Atomic Energy Agency, a subdivision of the United Nations. The UN has sent word to MSF that they wish to carry out an inspection, but Big Boss and his partner Kazuhira Miller, aka Kaz, suspect that the inspection is actually a ruse by Cypher, seeking revenge for what Big Boss did to Paz. They refuse, but their chief engineer, Huey Emmerich, approves the inspection. Unwilling to draw more negative attention from the UN by negating Huey's approval, they quickly prepare for the inspection by sending all soldiers, weapons, and armored vehicles off base, save for Metal Gear Seek, which would be stored underwater. During these preparations, Kaz intercepts reports from Cypher that Poss was still alive and being held at a US naval base in Cuba, known as Camp Omega. They also learn that the base was recently converted into a black site by the Strike Force division of Cypher titled XOF. Big Boss decided it would be in MSF's interest to retrieve her, so they could interrogate her about Cypher. Word about Poss's survival caught the ear of Chico, the child soldier from Peace Walker. His blinding love for Poss motivated him to act outside of MSF's wishes and try to rescue her himself. Naturally, this resulted in his capture at the base. Things complicate themselves during Big Boss's infiltration. When saving Chico, Chico reveals that he was subjected to torture, and gave up information regarding the location of MSF's mother base as a consequence. This makes Big Boss hasten his rescue of Poss, who he also finds out was not only subjected to torture, but had a bomb placed inside her stomach. Questions regarding why Paz was tortured by her own agency would have to be left for later, given that they were short on time. Luckily, they managed to remove the bomb, albeit with unconventional methods, like not using anesthetic. As they flew back towards Mother Base, they witnessed smoke and flames billowing over the horizon. Cypher had found MSF. Worse yet, the remaining MSF soldiers had yet to be evacuated. Big Boss was only able to save one soldier before being forced to retreat, leaving everything he had worked so hard to build to crumble into the heartless sea. During the retreat, Poss wakes up, immediately warning Big Boss and the others about the bomb inside of her. They reassured her that they removed the bomb, but then she revealed that there was actually a second one inside of her, in a place that Cypher knew Big Boss would never look. In order to save the lives of those aboard the chopper, Poss jumped out of the chopper mid-flight, and while doing so, the bomb went off inside of her. Unfortunately, the explosion happened too close to the chopper, and it, along with everybody inside, was sent crashing into the ocean. V has come to. Big Boss wakes up from the peaceful embrace of his coma into a new, hellish reality. Not only has he lost his left arm and has shrapnel sticking out of his forehead, he has lost nine years of his life. Before he can even begin to process the grief that these injuries would most definitely elicit, XOF descends upon the hospital. First, a sole member of XOF attempts to assassinate Big Boss on her own but a nearby hospital patient subdues her, setting her on fire and sending her tumbling out of a nearby window. Big Boss asks the patient who he is, but the patient gives him a couple of peculiar answers. First, he says that Big Boss is talking to himself, but then he asks Big Boss to call him Ishmael. This is appropriate, given the fact that the medical staff were referring to Big Boss as Ahab, and both Ahab and Ishmael are main characters in the Herman Melville revenge novel, Moby Dick. As Big Boss and Ishmael attempt to escape, they witness a variety of not only violent, but supernatural phenomena. Alongside the XOF forces indiscriminately murdering every person in the hospital, they see a floating boy with seemingly telepathic abilities. A man on fire, who remains alive despite being set aflame, and even a fiery whale appearing in the sky, which once again mirrors Moby Dick. Though both get separated amidst the chaos, they both manage to escape death. Once Big Boss reached safety, 
he encountered a face that is immediately recognizable to Metal Gear fans, but was somehow not immediately recognizable to him, despite their history. Just as he has appeared in all the other mainline Metal Gear games, Revolver Ocelot returns to support his idol one last time. Ocelot reveals a number of things. In Big Boss's absence, Koss has been trying to rebuild MSF under a different name, the Diamond Dogs. Koss was also the one who contracted Ocelot to Cyprus to save Big Boss. But around the time this contract was made, Koss was captured by XOF forces. Soon after, Big Boss locates Koss, but finds him on the brink of death. This is because XOF torturously removed his arm and his leg in order to extract information. After a brief skirmish with some of XOF's specialized forces, Big Boss manages to extract Kaz. When Big Boss leaves Kaz to be looked after by Diamond Dog medics, Kaz makes Big Boss promise that they will get revenge on XOF and Cypher. Though Big Boss agrees, he is adamant that this revenge will not be predicated on what happened in the past. Rather, it will be about building a new future. Before I continue, I need to provide a qualifying statement regarding the structure of MGS 5 story and how it will affect my continued analysis. Though I believe MGS 5 story is the weakest, it is nonetheless the biggest. If I were to go through every individual event that takes place in the story, we would be here for more than three hours. Which I know a lot of you would be up for, but I currently lack the resources and time to complete a project like that. From this point on, I will only be referencing the plot threads and characters that are relevant to the themes of race and revenge. In the first chapter of MGS5, Big Boss and the Diamond Dogs complete multiple missions that not only allow them to rebuild, but also to discover the leaders behind the attack on MSF nine years ago. In that time, they encounter multiple allies and enemies that evoke the one-word themes. The clearest and simplest example I can point to is the Floating Boy, who we all know is Psycho Mantis from Metal Gear Solid 1. In this game, he is exclusively referred to as the Third Boy. I won't get into how he became entangled with XOF, because frankly it's irrelevant and convoluted. Plus, I am on record for saying that I think Psycho Mantis's inclusion in the latter games is due less to narrative purpose and more for fan service. But I will admit, if we ignore Psycho Mantis's relevance to the narrative and focus squarely on the themes of race and revenge, one could argue that he is the prime example for not just MGS5, but the whole saga. As we learned from MGS1, Psycho Mantis' mother died in childbirth, and his father sought revenge on him for this. As a form of protection, Psycho Mantis not only used his psychokinetic abilities to kill his father, but burned down his village. He then spent his life willingly joining military organizations, simply because he, quote, wanted an excuse to kill as many people as he could. I don't think it's much of a stretch to argue that Mantis's genocidal tendencies stem from a desire to seek revenge on account of his race. If we define race as the immutable characteristics that one is born with, the two key characteristics that define Mantis's race are his psychokinetic abilities and the original sin that was cast upon him by his father. Both caused Mantis an unimaginable amount of stress in his youth so much so that it weakened his will, making the only option seem to be total revenge on existence. Though this genocidal tendency is not justifiable, it is understandable. That said, by being in MGS5, he serves as a hellish reminder of the worst case scenario for someone that succumbs to their desire for revenge. And speaking of MGS1, another character from that game makes a reappearance, the aforementioned Eli codenamed Liquid Snake. In MGS5, we see Liquid in his youth, during a period of time where, one could argue, he has yet to fully choose the vengeful path he takes in MGS1. If you will recall, Liquid is resentful because he was brought up to believe that he was inherently broken. Though he was a product of the Les Enfants Terribles project, birthed to be a clone of a legendary soldier, he was told that his race, his genes were manipulated to become recessive, so that his brother, Solid Snake, could have dominant genes. But remember, this isn't true. 
In fact, the reverse is true. But Big Boss figured that telling Liquid this as a young child would make him work harder to be a better man. Though Liquid did work harder, he did not do so for utilitarian purposes. He did so in order to surpass Big Boss and Solid Snake and seek revenge on the world, which took its ultimate form during the Shadow Moses nuclear crisis in Metal Gear Solid 1. Like with Psycho Mantis, Liquid's presence in Metal Gear Solid 5 is thematically appropriate. But once again, we do not gain much of a greater appreciation for his villainy, nor do we learn much more about him aside from what he was doing at this point in the timeline. If I were to steal Man, both of their presences in this game, I would say that they do help bolster the one-word themes as they relate to other characters. They are the garnish, that help make one's enjoyment of a meal that much keener. By far though, they serve a greater purpose than Metal Gear Solid 1. But now we move on to a character that gives a great deal of narrative purpose to Metal Gear Solid 5's themes of race and revenge. One of the people that Big Boss encounters, or rather re-encounters, during the first chapter is Huey Emmerich. In the nine years that passed since MSF's destruction, he has been working for XOF, producing a new model of Metal Gear for them codenamed Sahelanthropus. After Big Boss's awakening, Diamond Dogs receives word that he wishes to defect. This was strange because Huey should know that he is a prime suspect in MSF's destruction, while with the approval of the quote-unquote United Nations inspection. Nonetheless, they decide to rescue him because the intel he could provide Diamond Dogs about Cypher would be invaluable. In regards to the theme of revenge, Huey serves as a litmus test for the wills of all the Diamond Dogs, regarding whether or not they give in to the temptation for revenge. There are times where all the Diamond Dogs, including Big Boss, give in to that temptation. After all, Big Boss is willing to let Huey be tortured without a fair trial. But was Huey responsible? Or was Chico responsible when he gave up information during torture? At first, I was inclined, in all my naivety, to think Huey wasn't responsible, given the fact that he wanted to quote-unquote defect from XOF to Diamond Dogs despite the torturous interrogation he would inevitably face, maybe even the death penalty if found guilty. However, the lack of a clear answer regarding this made me seek help from my community. Though nobody provided me with any damning evidence, the comments I received actually made me change my mind. One comment, from somebody named Big Burr, pointed to the language used by the XOF leader when he discovered Huey's desire to defect. His use of the word traitor felt like it had greater weight, as if it was referencing an initial willingness on Huey's part to defect to XOF. At first, I felt embarrassed for this hole in my knowledge of the Metal Gear canon. But when I reconsidered Huey's purpose in MGS5's story, I quickly forgave myself. Huey's purpose is to evoke confusion and paranoia in not only the Diamond Dogs, but the Gamer, to see how quickly our minds will jump to conclusions when there's a lack of information. If we held the future of Huey's life in our hands, how long would we last before our paranoia broke our will? How long before we attempted to cure that painful paranoia through a vengeful act, foregoing any notion of a fair trial? We will continue this line of thought in Chapter 2. Before I return to the main story, I would like to give a brief nod to the character of Quiet. Her relevance to the theme of revenge becomes more relevant later, but there is one moment early on that is worth mentioning. Quiet is a sniper and an assassin working for XOF. She randomly encounters Big Boss during one of his missions in Afghanistan. After a lengthy duel between the two, Big Boss, and by extension the player, are given the choice of either killing her or sparing her. Now aside from Metal Gear Solid 1, the other Metal Gear Solid games rarely give the player any agency regarding the outcome of the story. Here though, the player is given their own opportunity to exact revenge. You can kill Quiet, or you can bring her back to Mother Base so she can accompany you on missions. If you kill her, you miss out on one of the game's biggest storylines. A storyline that makes good use of the revenge theme in an unexpected way. Quiet's purpose in the story is to demonstrate the infinite reward that can come by using one's will to restrain vengeance. But seeing that most of this reward comes later on in the story, 
we will, once again, have to wait until Chapter 2 for a full analysis. After having encountered each of these characters, Big Boss learns of a mysterious plague breaking out on Mother Base, one that makes the symptomatic die very soon after infection. Nobody knows what caused the infection, but the one constant pattern Diamond Dogs found amongst those who had the disease is that they all spoke the same language, Kakongo. Big Boss learned from a member of his intel team that there was a man in Africa being held captive by Cypher, a man that might know something regarding the pathogen. This man was referred to as Code Talker. When Big Boss rescues Code Talker, he learns about the cause of the pathogen on Mother Base and its links to Cypher. Firstly, the pathogen is caused by what are known as vocal cord parasites. Code Talker first discovered the parasites from the remains of an ancient sniper known as The End, whom Big Boss fought in Metal Gear Solid 3. The leader of XOF, whom we'll discuss more in a moment, also discovered these parasites from a body excavated in a permafrost region. XOF kidnapped Code Talker and forced him to weaponize the permafrost variant. Why? With the information Code Talker had, we are led to believe that XOF planned to use the parasite in the same way that it was used on the soldiers who spoke Kakongo. At first, Kaz and Big Boss suspect that it is XOF's goal to eliminate every language off the face of the planet except for English. This would line up with Zero's long-term goals of uniting the world via information control. But nothing is definitive, especially because there are some things going on with Cypher that don't make sense. The primary question that still doesn't have an answer is why Cypher tortured Paz when she was a self-proclaimed Cypher agent. Moreover, where was Zero? And who is this man with the disfigured face that seems to be doing all of Cypher's work? Is he truly carrying out Zero's will? After months of recruitment and weapons manufacturing, Big Boss was finally able to seek answers to these and other questions by going after XOF's leader. Code Talker told him that he could be located at an area known as OKB Zero in Afghanistan. During his infiltration, the XOF leader and his soldiers apprehend Big Boss. Over the next several minutes, the leader reveals everything. His background, his intentions, everything except his real name. Which, I argue, is purposeful. His lack of a proper name is evocative of the theme of race. Like Psychomantis and Liquid Snake, this man grew up with a set of immutable characteristics that hampered his ability to live. He was born in Hungary, to a pair of factory workers in northern Transylvania. He grew up around the time of World War II, and due to his location, he was forced by Nazi Germans to adopt their language and customs. Years after the occupation, his village suffered bombing by Allied forces, attempting to force the Nazis out. When attempting to flee the bombing, he sustained several injuries, most notably having his face doused in boiling oil. He somehow survived these injuries when he was transferred to a hospital, despite a recommendation from a nurse that he be euthanized out of mercy. Following the end of World War II, he worked in an official capacity as a spy and assassin in the Soviet Union, though many of his actions during this time were obviously treasonous. For instance, in Metal Gear's official history, he was responsible for ordering a military officer to assassinate Joseph Stalin. The motivation behind this decision will become evident in a moment. Following Stalin's assassination, he defected to the West, eventually joining the Secret Air Service. It was here that he met Zero. Zero was so impressed with the man's skills that he employed him at every opportunity. This employment lasted for years, right from when he was a part of Big Boss's support unit during Operation Snake Eater, right until Big Boss and Zero began their deliberations over the boss's will. Zero's perception of the boss's will disgusted the deformed man. In Zero's ideal world, every living human would suffer the same fate that the deformed man did. They would all have to abandon their culture, their language, their identity, in the service of a unifying vision. From this point on, the deformed man was only officially Zero's employee, when in reality, everything he did would be in opposition to Zero's dream. He went so far as to send vocal cord parasites to Zero, as a way of taking him out of the equation and taking full control of Cypher. 
This man's lack of a real name is a persistent reminder to all who encounter him of the phantom pain he suffered, and continues to suffer. His placeholder name is symbolic of the race that existence inflicted upon him, and the demon it turned him into. Outside of maybe Satan, or some other demon's name, few other names would be more appropriate for such a character than Skullface, not just for his demonic appearance, but for his demonic character. Now granted, opposing Zero's plan, at least in my mind, is a virtuous act. However, Skullface was like Zero and Big Boss in that he too wanted to see the boss's will vindicated beyond the grave. He had a view of her will that he wished to enact, one that was arguably the worst out of the three. Skullface revealed to Big Boss his plan with the vocal cord parasites. Unlike what Koss and Big Boss originally thought, Skullface's plan wasn't to wipe out all languages save for English. Rather, it was to eliminate English as the dominant language and, ideally, return all languages and cultures to a state of equal status. This equilibrium would be maintained by supplying every culture with their own nuclear-equipped Metal Gears, so that anybody who threatened to overtake them would risk nuclear retaliation. While I believe most people can reasonably argue that Metal Gear Solid V's story is weak relative to the other entries, I will argue to the death that Skullface is one of the most intriguing and well-written villains in the saga. Unlike a Liquid Snake or a Colonel Vulcan, Skullface's villainy commands a greater deal of sympathy. I doubt that anybody watching this video would be able to maintain a stable moral compass after having gone through what Skullface did. Granted, some might argue that his plan doesn't make as much logical sense. By supplying every culture in the world with nuclear weapons, wouldn't that increase the likelihood of nuclear war? Couldn't one overzealous dictator provoke a global nuclear exchange? One could put this down to bad writing, but I think one could also put this down to the blinding effect that revenge has on a person. In Skullface's case, I see him as someone so blinded by a desire for revenge that he does everything he can to convince himself that what he is doing is right, so he can uphold his calm, collected, and seemingly rational persona. In reality, though, this persona masks, to quote cause, an even deeper, darker void beyond zero. One that secretly wills the destruction of everything. After explaining his plans to Big Boss, Skullface manifests Psycho Mantis and the Man on Fire. Before killing Big Boss, Skullface alludes to the reason why the Man on Fire lives despite his fiery state. He says it has something to do with the man's desire for revenge, which Mantis uses to animate the man. But before this mysterious, fiery man can recompense his mysterious slight, Mantis detects an even deeper desire for revenge nearby. Nearby, Koss, Huey, and Eli ride in a support helicopter. Mantis detects Eli's deep hatred for Big Boss, one that somehow surpassed the Man on Fire. Seizing on an obvious opportunity, Mantis causes the Man on Fire to seemingly commit suicide, switching to Eli as his new psychic power source. He combines his and Eli's mental power to, somehow, activate Sahelanthropus, which they use to kill the XOF forces and leave Skullface trapped under rubble and rebar. After a lengthy battle, Big Boss manages to not destroy Sahelanthropus, but weaken it enough to the point where Eli and Mantis could not maintain control over it. When the battle was over, Kaz and Big Boss walk over to Skullface and exact their revenge. Using Skullface's rifle, Big Boss and Kaz blow off his right arm and left leg, mirroring the injuries that Kaz suffered at XOF's hands. Skullface pleads for death, but Kaz discards his gun just out of his reach, all the while taunting him to do it himself. As they walked away, Huey walks up to Skullface without their knowledge and shoots him in the head, happily and ironically declaring revenge. The chapter ends, with Kaz acknowledging that the phantom pain that he and the other Diamond Dogs had still lingers, but instead of looking inward to cease their vengeful spirits, they continue to project outwards. As long as Cypher exists, they will fight against it, hoping to avenge their fallen comrades and relieve themselves of the emptiness that poisons them from within. But as we find out in Metal Gear Solid 4, 
the efforts of Big Boss, Zero, and the respective organizations would all be in vain. Chapter 2 differs from Chapter 1 in that it feels like a scattered series of endings to unfulfilled plot threads. By contrast, Chapter 1 felt like it had a more traditional structure, with a beginning, middle, and a satisfying, if incomplete, ending. As we go through these additional endings, I will be applying a scale of relevance based on the one-word themes, going from what I feel is the least relevant to the most. To start, I will quickly acknowledge the Man on Fire and his miraculous reappearance in Chapter 2. Yes, we all suspected long before the game came out that he was the reanimated corpse of Colonel Volgan. Volgan's appearance in this game is similar to that of Psychomantis and Liquid Snake. He is the garnish that accentuates the meal. He is relevant to the theme of revenge in that Mantis is able to make use of Volgan's vengeful spirit and use it to reanimate his dead body. Aside from that, however, his presence in this game bears the least purpose. Unlike Mantis and Liquid, whose desire for revenge is inherent to their presence throughout the Metal Gear saga, Volgan's desire for revenge is exclusive to MGS5. His thematic relevance struggles to be present not only for this reason, but because he was written to be quasi-one-dimensional in the first place. This isn't a criticism, by the way. What made Volgan such a cool, despicable villain in MGS3 was his one-dimensionality. It's what made him so much fun to hate. Unfortunately, by deciding to make him one-dimensional in the first place, it makes it hard to elicit a greater amount of investment for him if you decide to make him relevant later on. It's even harder when you're dead. As a fan of Metal Gear, I wasn't offended by this form of fan service. At first, it was cool to see Volgan, just as it was cool to see Mantis and Liquid. But as the years go by, the magic of those initial encounters has begun to fade. Now let's return to the main story. At the beginning of Chapter 2, Big Boss, Kaz, and Ocelot express their continued discomfort with Huey's presence. They were never able to confirm his guilt regarding the attack on MSF nine years ago. Now that Skullface was out of the picture, they had time to search for evidence. Big Boss begins his search for clues by returning to the location he initially saved Huey from. There, he re-encounters the Mammal Pod, the AI that contained a copy of the boss's consciousness and was used to power Peace Walker in the last game. Big Boss has Diamond Dogs retrieve the pod and bring it back to Mother Base. During inspection, they open the Mammal Pod and make a startling discovery. They find the corpse of Strangelove, the creator of the Mammal Pod AI from Peace Walker. Unfortunately, they were unable to immediately question Huey about this, because an even greater problem mandated their attention, one that was taking place in the quarantine zone. Though Code Talker was able to manufacture a vaccine that would stave off the effects of the initial parasite strain, the strain has since mutated, metastasizing at a faster and deadlier rate. Seeing that nothing could be done for the soldiers, Big Boss figured that the right thing to do would be to mercy kill the infected. Though watching the death of these soldiers is gut-wrenching as it is, the emotional weight of this is heightened by the fact that we, the gamer, are responsible for putting them down. With every man we kill, the staff died notification pops up. For several hours prior, we had been used to seeing those numbers go up with every new man or resource that we gathered. Now, those numbers drop at a rate that parallels our insides. With every fallen comrade, we feel ourselves descending further and further into hell. It turns out that this didn't happen naturally. The Diamond Dogs discovered that the mutation was facilitated by Huey. Though one could reasonably suggest that this was an accident, the Diamond Dogs discover that Huey was in contact with DARPA, an organization that was affiliated with Cypher. Their intel showed that Huey was looking to sell a superior version of the Parasite to DARPA in exchange for protection. And if this wasn't damning enough, they discovered that Huey was almost definitely responsible for the death of Strangelove. Apparently, when Huey was designing Sahelanthropus, Skullface demanded that it not be piloted by AI. He did not want a repeat of what happened at the end of Peace Walker, after all. 
In the place of AI, Huey designed the cockpit in such a way that it would fit a small child. Ideally, his son, Hal, who he fathered with Strange Love, would pilot it. For obvious reasons, Strange Love was not fond of this idea when she found out, and so she had Hal sent to the United States to protect him. When Huey found out what Strange Love had done, he forced her inside the mammal pod and locked her in, where she died by suffocation. Now I ask you, the viewer, what kind of punishment you would deal out to somebody who not only killed the mother of his child, but was responsible for the death of roughly hundreds of men, if not thousands, if you include the MSF attack? Might you be inclined to seek revenge by giving Huey the death penalty? Surprisingly, Big Boss shows remarkable restraint regarding Huey's actions. Not only does he give him a fair trial, but he spares his life. His justification for this is remarkably consistent with the principles that he and Diamond Dogs live by. Their organization is predicated on a lack of ideology or morality. They do not have the right or authority to execute Huey. The only circumstance that would permit execution is if somebody contracted them to do so. Because of this, Big Boss decides to, instead, exile Huey from Mother Base, leaving him with just a raft and enough supplies to reach land. Huey's relevance to the theme of revenge is as obvious as it is grand, but I would argue that he is a greater exemplar of the theme of race, and this becomes obvious when we consider his and his son's presence in the Metal Gear Solid saga as a whole. Just as Solid and Liquid Snake were cursed by the sins of their father, with Big Boss, Metal Gear Solid V shows how Hal Emmerich, aka Otacon, was forced to suffer a similar fate. Recall what Otacon said about his father in Metal Gear Solid 1. Both of them spent their lives as military engineers, creating weapons of mass destruction. It was so much a part of their identities that Otacon figured the curse of nuclear weapons was written into his DNA. It was as immutable a characteristic as one's race is. But like Solid Snake, Otacon refused his father's heritage. Unlike Mantis, Liquid, or Skullface, Otacon would not seek revenge on his father or the world for the race that he was cursed with. Instead, he forged his own path forward, and did so in such a potent way that he earned his place alongside an equally heroic figure. Now normally, I try to provide clean, breezy transitions between my analysis and my retelling of the story, but I struggle in the case of Quiet. She has played a part in all the story's events that I have described up until this point, but her relevance to them is not immediately obvious, especially in regards to the one-word themes. If I were to have brought her up at any point prior to this, it would have simply been to point out that she was just there, which would have interrupted the flow of my script. But now that we're on the subject of heroism, I felt it would be appropriate to reintroduce her. Quiet's importance as a character is hard to discern at first, primarily because, well, she doesn't speak. This trait makes it difficult to appreciate her as a character in and of herself. Yet I would argue that, like almost all the other female characters in the Metal Gear saga, she serves as the moral center of the story a beacon of light, and a source of strength for the male protagonists. Recall what I said about Big Boss sparing Quiet's life early on, and how that one act resulted in infinite reward. It was a risk, no doubt. After all, anybody with eyes could see that she was the one who tried to kill Big Boss in the Cypress Hospital. Plus, as we learn later on, Skullface intended to use her to spread the vocal cord parasites to the Diamond Dogs. This is why she doesn't speak throughout the game. If she speaks English, not only does she die, but her infection spreads to the other soldiers. But what made her change her mind? Well, we learn later on in the story that it wasn't just the loss of her own life that deterred her. In Chapter 2, Quiet suffers chemical burns after diving into a vat of chlorine disinfectant. She did this to rescue a necklace, which belonged to a former child soldier stationed on the base. When receiving medical treatment, a white petal is discovered inside her lungs. This petal was from a Star of Bethlehem flower, the very same flower whose petals were omnipresent in the Cypress Hospital. 
This confirms, did Big Boss cause an ocelot that Quiet was the assassin who tried to kill Big Boss at the beginning of the game? Worse yet, the English strain of the vocal cord parasite was detected within her, and the only person who could have given that to her was Skullface. These revelations motivate Kaz and Ocelot to torture Quiet for information. Here, we see Quiet demonstrate a remarkable amount of strength and will. If she screamed or said a name, she risked triggering the vocal cord parasite and sparking an outbreak, despite what Kaz said to the contrary. This kind of strength was something that not even Solid Snake or Raiden could manifest while they were being tortured in the first two games. They screamed in pain, but Quiet somehow does not. With no official knowledge to go off of, Ocelot deduces that Quiet's refusal to speak was not just because she wished to self-preserve, but because she was in love with Big Boss and all that he stood for. She wanted to remain alive to further his ambitions, his legend. Her continued existence would be symbolic of the gratitude she felt for Big Boss's mercy as well as the respect she had for his skills in defeating her. Any skepticism that the gamer or big boss had for the depth of this love would be eradicated in Quiet's final moments. Quiet abandoned Mother Base following the Parasite mutation, fearing that she might suffer the same fate. Soon after, she was captured by Soviet forces in Afghanistan. Big Boss goes to rescue her, but before they could escape, they were ambushed by an enormous tank unit, arguably the most difficult encounter in the entire game. Though they were mostly successful, Quiet was knocked out by a tank round, forcing an attempted retreat through a vicious sandstorm. During the escape, Big Boss is bitten by a cobra, causing him to lose consciousness. Miraculously, they eluded the pursuit of the Soviets while they were unconscious, primarily due to the protection of the sandstorm. When Quiet regained consciousness, she heard a voice on Big Boss's radio. It was a support helicopter, requesting a landing zone. The support helicopter wouldn't be able to stay long, due to the lack of visibility. If it left, then Big Boss might die, either on account of the Cobra Bite, or discovery by the Soviets. Quiet picked up the radio, and attempted to guide the helicopter while speaking in Navajo, but this was incomprehensible to the English-speaking pilot. Seeing that there was no other way to secure Big Boss's safety, Quiet makes the ultimate sacrifice. She starts speaking English to the pilot, and guides him to Big Boss's location. Big Boss is supplied an antivenom, and soon regains consciousness, but Quiet is nowhere to be found. Nearby, Big Boss discovers a tape hanging from a tree branch. On the tape is Quiet's voice, the first he had ever heard her speak. She explains that once, she was driven purely by a desire for revenge, but after meeting Big Boss, she found something deeper and more fulfilling to live for, something that could not be expressed in words. Though she would soon be dead, she was grateful not only for the new life that Big Boss gave her under Diamond Dogs, but for the love they both shared. Quiet may not have been the most interesting character, but what she represents is of the utmost importance. That being, the quintessential attitude that one must adopt in the face of impossible circumstances. As long as one's life isn't threatened, it is in one's interest to adopt an ethic based in love, courage, and reciprocal mercy. When Big Boss showed Quiet mercy, it made Quiet choose to act in a way that not only saved his life, but the lives of all the Diamond Dogs. Now, it was up to not only Big Boss, but the player, to follow her example. Doing so, however, would not come without significant challenge, the greatest of which comes at the end of the game. We have been led to believe that for the entirety of Metal Gear Solid 5, we have been playing as the legendary Big Boss, but in classic Kojima fashion, the rug is pulled out from right under us. Do you recall Ishmael, the one who escaped the hospital with you at the beginning of the game? He was actually Big Boss. So, who are we? Well, we play the medic, the one that extracted the bomb from Paz's stomach at the end of Ground Zeroes. 
Following the helicopter crash at the end of the game, the medic is given plastic surgery and hypnotherapy to transform him into a copy of Big Boss. This was done so that the real Big Boss could go into hiding, to have the world's attention taken off of him and placed onto Venom's snake. This would ensure that he could fulfill his dream of Outer Heaven without the interference or knowledge of organizations like Cypher or the world's governments. All of this is relayed to Venom's snake through a cassette tape made by Big Boss. Big Boss thanks Venom for everything, saying that the legend of Big Boss now belonged to both of them. Due to Venom's lack of a clear identity, he serves as a sort of avatar for the gamer, much like Raiden did for the majority of Metal Gear Solid 2. But unlike Raiden, who became his own person at the end of that game, Venom's snake is us, and we are him. Now, there are two ways one can take this information. On the one hand, Hideo Kojima brought the gamer closer to fulfilling the fantasy they have had ever since Metal Gear Solid 1. The fantasy of being a legendary soldier. By making Venom Snake's identity inextricable from that of the gamer, Kojima made the gamer an active character in the Metal Gear saga. This narrative choice can be seen as a love letter to the fans, but simultaneously, it can reasonably be viewed as a terrifying evocation of not only the revenge theme, but the saga's overarching theme of will. One must simply ask themselves this question. What about the medic? Who was he? What is his opinion about all of this? Was his will overridden by the wills of Big Boss and his team? Does he want to be somebody else? Put yourself in Venom Snake's shoes. What would you do after finding out everything you were? Your former life, your former identity, was erased. Would you seek revenge? Or would you give up your revenge? Lay your arms down, just as the boss did, and leave the world as it is. It's easy to say that revenge is always bad when you haven't struggled in the same way that the characters of Metal Gear did. I imagine that most of us would give into feelings of resentment, similar to how Big Boss and his former allies did following the death of his mentor. I must admit, I struggle with feelings of resentment to this day over much lesser slights, one of them being the current status of the Metal Gear franchise. I believe that there are other stories that could have been told in this series, ones that went beyond Hideo Kojima. If Metal Gear Rising is any indication, a carefully chosen team of writers and developers could carry the series beyond Hideo Kojima's original vision. But as long as Konami holds on to the production rights, the likelihood of that happening is nil. Given how much Metal Gear Solid means to me, I continue to struggle with feelings of resentment towards Konami. I've struggled with them for over seven years. It's a phantom pain that never lets up. Nonetheless, I know I have the power and the will to contend with that pain. Metal Gear Solid taught me that feelings of resentment, the desire for revenge, it's not helpful. It's not productive. What would be productive is following the boss's example. We must accept the world the way it is, respect the will of others, and believe in our own. With Metal Gear Solid, it is our responsibility, as fans, to keep the legacy of this series alive to share it with those who have not experienced it, to teach others the powerful lessons these games have taught us. And by doing so, the memory of these games will linger in the hearts and minds of generations to come.